right, well, that brings us to this morning. Before I get to this morning's message, I just have to say thank you. Um, I have to admit, it was my birthday this last week, and I turned 50 years young. And if I'm trying to, well, if I'm trying to sound like I feel young, it's because I am trying to convince myself of that. Um, but I had a ton of people stop by and make phone calls and drop off gifts and cards. And I just got a Cougar football helmet today someone gave to me. Um, but I just want to tell everybody, thank you. I really, really appreciated that. Okay, but now that we've done that, here's what I want you to do. I want you to close your eyes. If you feel safe, if you feel comfortable, it's a good, safe place to do it. Close your eyes, because I don't want you distracted, and I'm going to say a word, and I want you to see what image pops into your head. Okay? So close them up, and here's the word that I'm going to say. The word is pilgrim. Okay? Keep your eyes closed, and just see what image comes to mind. All right, now open them up. I'm going to show you a couple different pilgrim examples. I googled the word pilgrim, and one of the pictures I saw was this, okay? There's your typical stock photo from your grade school classroom, the ones we've all seen. You maybe had something like that here, the next one. For all of us children of the 70s, or if you were parents who had children in the 70s, we all waited for the Thanksgiving um, Snoopy special to come on Peanuts, and you would see Snoopy and Woodstock. Here's one more option. Okay, that's for you more academic-minded. That's kind of like your picture that you see in the dictionary. And all three of those, they're different, but all three of those build off the idea of this American pilgrim, okay? The colonists who traveled over on the Mayflower, they led to the, the creation of our country, and it's probably like, anybody see an image, something like that or that type of pilgrim? Raise your hand. Okay, here's what I tell you. I believe the majority of us would see that, and it makes sense because it's a part of our cultural heritage. But also, if you Google the word or if you look it up in the dictionary, pilgrim, one of the actual definitions you'll find is when it's capitalized, it means one of the English colonists settling at Plymouth in 1620. Okay, so to me, it makes sense. That's the image that comes to mind. But here's the funny thing if you Google the word pilgrim, other images will come up. I want to show you two others that come up. Okay, this first one, that's a picture of a bunch of Christian pilgrims who are in the Jordan River and they were baptized um, in the exact river where Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, okay? And that is a picture of pilgrims. Let's go to the next one. Here's a bunch of Christian pilgrims and they are in Jerusalem, and they traveled to Jerusalem for Palm Sunday because their desire was to be at the city where Jesus was originally welcomed with people with waving palm fronds yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna. Okay? And those are both pictures of Christian pilgrims because there's a second definition of the word pilgrim, and it is one who travels to a shrine or a holy place as a devotee. Okay? Someone who, because of their faith, they take a trip, they take a pilgrimage to what's considered a holy or sacred site. And we actually have some people from our church who right now are doing that. I was going to put their picture up, but then I thought it'd be announcing to the whole world they're out of the country, and that probably wasn't good. Um, so I didn't put their picture up. But it means taking a trip because of your faith to visit a site. And people still do that to this very day. Anybody think of those type of pilgrims? Okay, all right, one or two of you did. I know some of you have done that. Okay, but I want to share a third example with you. And this third example is something that I would doubt made any of us like have an image in our head because it's one we don't often think of. And I don't have an image to put up on the screen to show you, but here's what I'll tell you. If you look around yourselves right now or even look at yourselves right now, you would be seeing a modern-day pilgrim. Because if you're a follower of Jesus, then what it would mean is that we, by very definition, are pilgrims. And you maybe think, Scott, that doesn't make any sense to me. I've never even traveled out of the Pacific Northwest, you know, and I, I haven't traveled outside of anywhere. You know, how am I a pilgrim? But you are. I want you to listen to a third definition. This third definition is one who journeys in foreign lands. And again, you might think, Scott, I'm not an international traveler. I'm from the U.S. Heck, I'm from Selah. I'm right here. I am not a foreign traveler. But what I will tell you is if you are a follower of Jesus, if you call yourself a Christian, then we need to understand, and not only understand, but we once again need to embrace the idea that we are pilgrims. And the reason I say we need to do it again is because literally, if you look back in the history of our Christian faith, pilgrims are all throughout it. 
You don't have to look very far in the Bible to find pilgrims. In fact, in the very first book of the Bible, in Genesis, we read how God calls Abraham to leave his homeland and to go on this journey to a foreign land. And God says, listen, I'm going to bless you if you do that. And we see that Abraham lives this life traveling through foreign lands as a pilgrim, stepping into the place that God has called him and stepping into that blessing. We watch the following generations live out that same life. In the Bible, it is full of examples of pilgrims. There's a whole passage, a section of Psalms in the book of Psalms that are called Songs for Pilgrims as they ascend to Jerusalem. This idea of being a pilgrim and living life on a pilgrimage, it goes throughout our history. And today, I want us to focus especially on one passage. It comes from the book of Philippians. It was written by the Apostle Paul, and it talks about us as Christian pilgrims. And if you want, you can follow along in your Bible on an app, Philippians. It's in the back half of the Bible. And I want to give you a little bit of context. We'll have it up here on the screen as well, okay? And the context I want to give you is Philippians. It was written by the Apostle Paul, and it was a letter that was written to a group of early Jesus followers in a city called Philippi, okay? Now, what you need to know about Philippi is that it was primarily a colony of retired Roman soldiers, okay? And, and Paul had visited there a few years back. He'd planted this church, and then he'd moved on, and he's writing this letter. And the, where, he's writing this letter while he is in a Roman prison because of his belief in Jesus, and he's writing to these followers in Philippi who are feeling opposition and oppression because of their belief in Jesus. And he writes this letter. He's giving them encouragement and instruction on how to live out their faith in the midst of this oppression. And I want us to look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Here's what he writes to him. He says, But we are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. Okay? So this is Paul. He starts out by saying, listen, we are citizens of heaven. And I want us to dig into that, because we can just read it and move on, but we're not supposed to. And you read it, and you may just think, you know, that seems like a pretty safe, a pretty innocuous, just maybe a strange thing to say. But what we got to see is within that statement, Paul is giving them a reminder and a challenge that is anything but safe. And it, it's a strange statement, because think about it. Paul's writing from a Roman prison. They're living in Philippi. None of them are literally in heaven and by the very definition, all of these people, they are citizens of Rome, okay? Worldly, that's what they would be considered, citizens of Rome. And what you need to know is that's the best thing they could be at that time. Because if you were a citizen of Rome, Rome was a superpower. It was the lone superpower. And if you were, a, if you were like a citizen of Rome, it meant you had power and you had prestige. But here's Paul. He's writing to these people who are living in a place where they have power and prestige because of their citizenship, and he's saying, listen, if you believe, and because you believe, Jesus was the Son of God who gave his life on the cross, he died, he rose again, and then he ascended into heaven, because you believe that, you are no longer a citizen of Rome, you are now a citizen of heaven. And, you know, like to us, like I say, we can just read that, but we got to understand that was a hugely challenging statement because he was saying, listen, as followers of Jesus, you're supposed to let go of what the world tells you, gives you status and, get, and defines who you are and gives you power. You need to let go of that. And instead, you're supposed to call yourself a citizen of heaven. You're supposed to choose to be a pilgrim. Because really he's saying, listen, you are no longer of this world. You are no longer defined by this citizenship. You're choosing a different citizenship, and you are going to live as a foreigner in this land. And it can be easy to think, okay, you know, I, sure, I'll call myself a citizen of heaven. I'm willing to do that. But you've got to recognize, as Paul says this to these people, some of them had been born as citizens. So they were born in high standing. But others that he was writing to, they had paid for their citizenship. They had saved money. They had scrimped. They had paid to become a citizen of Rome. Some of them had probably earned that citizenship in Rome by their military service. They had put their life at risk all to become a citizen. And here's Paul saying, give that up. Claim a different citizenship. And that was huge. 
And the reason why it was so huge is it forced him to ask, are they going to hold on to what they know and what's defined them in the past? Or are they going to trust in Jesus and grab on to this new citizenship? And again, that wasn't a small thing because that is what defined them. It's what gave them purpose and power. You guys, what gives you purpose and power? I think there are some of us, and I'm leaving my notes, forget this. I think there are some of us who claim on to, maybe it is our national identity. Maybe it's our political identity. Maybe it's our school. Maybe it's our family. Maybe it's our friends. For them, it was real easy. It was the fact that they were a Roman citizen. I look out at us, and we have a whole bunch of things that define us. But Paul's words are still asking us, what are we going to grab onto? What are we going to use as the defining factor in our life? And he was saying, what defined you in the past no longer does. That is dead and gone. You're supposed to grab something new. And I think for us, because we all have the Bible, we have it on our phone, we probably have seven copies of it in our house, because we've all gathered at church, we've all heard this thing of like, listen, when you become a follower of Jesus, you have this new life in Christ. We can read that all throughout the Bible. They didn't have the entire Bible. What Paul was saying to them might have sounded brand new, but he's saying you're a new creation. Again, we've all heard that. You can, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, you've probably heard it over and over. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. We sang about it today. Like that past doesn't define us. We're new. I love how it expresses it in Colossians 3, 11. It says, in this new life, it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free, Christ is all that matters and he lives in all of us. It's saying, you guys, what used to define you, if you are a follower in Christ, nothing surpasses the call of Christ on your life. All of that is dead and gone. You are a new creation. And Paul wrote that as a guy who understood it. When he found Jesus, his life did a 180. It changed everything. But he knew that the only way that could happen is if you grabbed onto and claimed that citizenship. And he was reminding and he was challenging the Philippians, would they make that same choice? He's saying, you have a citizenship in heaven, are you going to claim it and live defined by that, or are you going to let the things of your past define you? And really he was saying, listen, if you're truly a follower of Jesus, then you are a pilgrim. You are now a citizen of heaven who's living here on earth and you are walking through a foreign land. And those words that he gave to them as a reminder and as a challenge, they're the same for us today. Because being a follower of Jesus and a Christian, it's not just about loving Jesus, it's about loving him and being led by him. There's a lot of things I love but I don't follow him. He's saying the same thing. He's like, listen, this has to be what defines you. It has to be what moves you. It means that claiming our citizenship in heaven is what drives us. So here'd be my question. And I want you to ask it of yourself. Would you literally say that you've grabbed onto and claimed your citizenship in heaven? When people look at you, is that how they define you? It starts with, and not that we're supposed to be judged by others, but we got to question the way we live our lives. How do people interpret that? What do they see? Being a citizen of heaven and living as a pilgrim, it means living first and foremost for Jesus and the kingdom of heaven. It means that surpasses all other things. Again, it doesn't matter what country you're from, which way you vote, which team you root for. I joke about it all the time, but the driving factor is your faith in Jesus. And it can be easy to say, you betcha, I love Jesus. Yep, I'm following Jesus. But it can be hard to do. And that's why I want us to revisit what does it mean to really be a pilgrim, to live our lives on pilgrimage. 
And one of the things I think we have to remember as we look at that and we try to say, how do we live it out? We got to remember, pilgrims are made to move, okay? It's a mandatory component of being a pilgrim. You are on a journey. You are a foreigner traveling through a foreign land, and that necessitates movement and change. And as Christian pilgrims, what are we supposed to be doing? Every day we're supposed to be stepping closer and closer to Jesus and looking like Jesus as we journey back to that home in heaven. And Christianity is not just about saying yes to Jesus and then sitting stagnant in our salvation. It's about walking out our faith and daily growing in it. And that growing, it's got to be a head and a heart thing. Like it's hard to live out what we don't know But if we just know about Jesus and don't apply it to our lives, that knowledge is worthless. And I think about, like, if we're talking about journeying and traveling, think about a map. I can have a map. I can know where I want to go. I can know how to get there. But unless I put rubber on the road and start moving, unless I do something with it, that map is worthless. The plain and simple truth is we have to keep moving. We have to learn, we have to grow, and then we got to put it in place. And I love it if, you know, if you read through the Gospels this summer with us, you read, how did Jesus call his first disciples? He looked at him, he said, come and follow me. He didn't say, come and study me. He didn't say, come and know about me. He didn't even say, love me. He said, follow me. Thirteen times in the Gospel, he speaks those words, follow me. Those words were for them and those words are for us. Because again, Christianity isn't just about loving Jesus, it's about loving him and being led by him. I'm in love with Jesus, but what I long is for my life to be in step with him. That's what we're all supposed to hunger for. And it's gonna look different in all of our lives because we're all at different points in our journey. We're all headed towards Jesus. We're all saying that's our home, but our path of where we are on that path, they're different. For some people, I literally believe there are people here who have looked on the sidelines and they've said, you know, this Jesus thing, I don't know enough. I kind of think I want to get started with him, but you're just scared. It starts by saying yes to Jesus and saying, do you know what? I am choosing to follow you. I think there are people here who made that choice long ago. They would claim the title of Christianity, but they're not doing anything with it. For you, it might be making that recommitment of, I'm going to start taking steps. I'm going to gather with others. I'm going to study your word and ask, what does it truly mean? And then instead of just looking at information, I'm going to do application because I want transformation. I want a new life in Jesus. That may look like serving, it may look like giving, it may look like leading, but it's going to look like change and growth. And I'll tell you, there's this passage in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. I want us to look at it, because I believe it gives a great description of what this living can look like. And I chose it because it talks about, really, we get to choose our citizenship. It tells you, you can choose to look like the world or look like the way that God is calling you. And it's really saying, which citizenship will you choose? And I'm going to read it to you in the message translation, okay? The message puts it in what I would say every day, just common language. And I love the way it expresses it. Here's what it says. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life. It means don't just think about your time at church or your Bible time or your quiet time. Take every portion of your life. You're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Don't accept that this world is your citizenship, he's saying. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. I love that translation. Because it reminds us, like, listen, our faith isn't about church. It isn't about our Bible time. It isn't about our small group. It's about all time. 
It's saying, are you going to live an all-in lifestyle for Jesus? He's saying, give it all. Don't just make it a part of your life. Let it be your life. Let it define you. Let that be the citizenship that drives you. And I love it. He says, hey, it's not easy. He says, this can only be done by God and what he can do for you. It's about remembering what he's already done for you. And then he challenges them and says, but live it out all day, every day, in all aspects of your life. So here would be my second question for you. Look at your life. How have you been changed by your relationship with Jesus? Think about it. How does your life look different? I've talked about before, like, I always say, I think it's good to know your two-minute testimony. Where you say, look, here's what my life looked like before Jesus. Here's when I met Jesus, and here's what it looks like now. Here's how he's changed me. But it's not just about that before Jesus and after Jesus. I'd say, how are you different this week than last week? How are you different this year than last year? Ask yourself this. Would the world see that difference in you? Or have you just become so accustomed to the world around you that you're comfortable living like it? Here's what I want us to think about. As citizens of heaven and as pilgrims who recognize this is not our home, people are supposed to see glimpses of heaven in us. Think about that. As people interact with us, as we go out to our workplaces, to our schools, to sports fields, to coffee shops, to restaurants, wherever we go, people are supposed to see glimpses of heaven in us. They're supposed to see it in you. They're supposed to see it in me. As citizens of heaven and as pilgrims who are traveling through this foreign land that we call earth, they should see heaven in us because we're the citizens of that. In 2 Corinthians, we read a little passage of that. Paul goes on and he talks about we're ambassadors. Ambassadors take what they have from their home country, they go to a foreign country, and they share that message. They're the representatives. People should see it in us. And our call, Cesar talked about this a couple weeks ago, how our call as followers of Jesus is to help usher heaven in on earth. That's a part of what we do. And the only way we can do that is if we remember that not only are we supposed to be on a journey where we're moving for Jesus, but as pilgrims, we're supposed to find joy in that journey as we go. And what I mean by that is citizens of heaven who are traveling... Our sights can't be so singularly set on heaven that we miss the journey and the joy of getting there. There's this famous poet, his name was Oliver Wendell Holmes. He was a doctor, he was a poet, and he one time talked about Christians who were so heavenly minded that they were no earthly good. And there's a lot of people smarter than me who battle over that, like, oh, that's so unfair, that's not right. Here's what I'll tell you, I don't know if it's fair or if it's right, but here's what I think he meant. We aren't supposed to be so focused on heaven that we miss the world around us as we get there. We're not supposed to be so set on studying about heaven and just sit there waiting for it to arrive or for us to get there that we miss out ushering it in and being the glimpses of heaven that the world around us needs to see. Instead, we're supposed to be bringing little glimpses of heaven everywhere we go. And while we set our sights there, we're supposed to watch the world around us and see who needs to experience it, who needs to see it, and be bold enough to be the ones who tell others about it. And the only way we can do that is if we have joy in the journey. And I gotta, I gotta be honest, I struggle with it sometimes. Because when you see the hurting world around you, there's times your heart just hurts too. But we're told we're always supposed to be able to say why we have our hope. That means people have to see our hope as we go through this journey. In the book of Hebrews, there's a portion of the Bible it's from the book of Hebrews, and they call it the Hall of Fame of Faith. It lists out all these people whose faith is just like, wow, they lived it out and they lived it out with integrity. And what I would say is they grabbed onto this idea that they are pilgrims. They didn't let this world drive them. They let their faith drive them. And it describes what they lived like. It goes everywhere. It talks about Noah and Abraham and Sarah. 
And it lists all these people. And then after it does, here's what it says about them. It comes from chapter 11, verses 13 through 16. I'll tell you again, this one is in the message translation again. It just puts it in ways we can hear. After listing these people who were pilgrims, who lived out their faith, it says each one of these people of faith died not yet having in hand what was promised. Like they knew what God's promise was, but they hadn't fully experienced it. They died before they did, but they were still believing when they died. How did they do that? They saw it way off in the distance. They waved their greeting like, listen, I know what God's promised. I see it up there, but I'm not there yet. And it says they accepted the fact that they were transients. In some translation, it says they accepted the fact that they were pilgrims. They were citizens of heaven who were down here. And they recognized that. And because they recognized that, they could keep walking down here because they knew where they were headed. And I want you to dial in because listen to what it says. It says people who live this way make it plain that they are looking for their true home. If they were homesick for their old country, they could have gone back anytime they wanted, but they were after a far better country than that, heaven country. They were saying, listen, I'm a new creation. I know where I'm supposed to be. I could go back. I could grab onto the things that used to define me, that used to bring me joy, but instead I know where I'm headed. I've got something better. I've been made a citizen of heaven. I am a new creation, and I won't look back. I'll keep moving forward. And it says, you can see why God is so proud of them and has a city waiting for them. The reason he has a city waiting for them and for us is because we're citizens. And if you're citizens, you have a place. And it says he has prepared that place. And I love that description because in it we find not only a description of what ancient pilgrims looked like, we find a description of what we're supposed to look like as pilgrims. And it describes traveling through a foreign land... And it says that they could do it because they were a new creation and they knew who'd created them. They didn't claim an earthly home because they were after something far better. It's the heavenly home that they knew they were made for. You guys, that's us. It describes the life that we are called to lead. And while we can't do it on our own, here's the beauty. We don't have to. God's Holy Spirit resides in us. What we can't do on our own, it gives us strength to do. And you're like, well, wait, I can't see that. That's okay. You can feel it. And we're going to be looking at a series that helps us look at that. But until, if you haven't experienced that, here's the other beauty. Look around. We're a church family who's supposed to walk together on this journey. We're a tribe of foreigners and pilgrims who know where we're headed we're supposed to be walking there with joy and letting others see it. And as we set our sights on Jesus and we journey together, people get glimpses of heaven and we get to bring them along. It was a couple months ago, I just saw this. It was something, I don't even remember where I saw it, but it was a poem or a prayer. I don't know what it was intended to be. It was written by a guy who calls himself a visual theologian. I don't even know what that is. Um, but I loved the poem. And whether it was a poem or a prayer, as I read it, here's what I saw it as. I saw it as the prayer for a current pilgrim, a prayer for a modern-day pilgrim, a person who understood that there's a higher call on their life as a follower of Jesus. And here's what I want to do. I want you just to close your eyes, and I'm going to read you this. And again, this is a portion of what he wrote, promoting this guy, but... This poem, to me, is just a prayer that if you want to live your life as a pilgrim, try praying these words. It says, my Lord, if I can't see where I'm going, may I just see you. For my heart has been obsessed with the destination and has forsaken the journey. As if you were the prize at the end and not the treasure by my side the whole time. May I never forget, you are the journey. For if I have found the end of you, then you were not God. My Lord, forgive me if I run ahead when you just want me to take your time. For time does not constrain you, it obeys you. Time is in your very breath. You inhale hours and exhale eternities. And when I feel behind, let me be reminded the reality is I'm in the middle. 
in the middle of a God who goes before me and a God who stands behind me and a God who is within me. Be the God I feel now breathing within me. I will not be out of step as long as I am walking within your grace. You guys, living as citizens of heaven is an ongoing journey. It's not trying to rush ahead. It's listening for God's Holy Spirit and letting him lead you as you travel as a pilgrim. It's a journey where we're always growing and we'll be growing, others will be growing, so we have to give ourselves grace and give others grace. But when we embrace that journey, when we keep our eyes on Jesus and on our heavenly home, and when we keep our eyes open for the people that are walking around us who need to hear about him and we share him, maybe it's in action, in just being a friend to the friendless, providing for someone who needs it and you know they need it and you give them in that need. Sometimes it's actions, other times it's words. That crazy thing, I was at a doctor's office and I just felt like I was supposed to pray for my doctor and I knew she was going to think I was a freak and I was just like, can I, I feel like I'm supposed to pray for you. Can I pray for you? She looked at me and said, I've never had anybody ask me that. And I said, well, <laughs> today you did, can I? She said, yes. God will give you times where you're supposed to call out and speak to someone. Don't be afraid. Don't be conformed to this world. Recognize we're pilgrims and we're headed somewhere else. God has given us that call. He's placed a spirit inside us, and he's surrounded us with a bunch of people to walk it out with. My literal prayer is that we'll remember that and that we will be a gathering, moving tribe of pilgrims who live it out in Selah because God's placed us here with a purpose. We have the challenge. Will we receive that and walk it out? Pray with me. Father God, forgive me for when I get ahead. When I think you've called me to a location and I forget the one who called me. Forgive me when I get worried of trying to think of like, what does every person here need to hear? God, I thank you that they're not being led by me. They're being led by you. Dear Lord, please open our ears. Let us hear how and where you are calling us. Let us not just get obsessed with the end point, but keep our eyes open as we travel. Let us not see pilgrimage as a big trip to a faraway place, but that our pilgrimage is to see you and to recognize everywhere we walk is holy ground that you're calling us. Father, if there are people here today who've never received that call in your life on their life, that you love them, that you have a higher call, that anything here, it doesn't define them. You do and your love does. Your grace does. Father, today, let them not ignore that, not stand at a distance. Let them step forward into that embrace. Father, if there are those of us who've heard that, we've received that, but we've just been stagnant, Give us vision of how and where you're calling us. Lord, we long to be a glimpse of heaven for the world around us. If we need to see that glimpse, Lord, let us see it in one another. God, I thank you for how you bless us. I thank you for how you love us. And I thank you that you do call us your children and citizens of heaven. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. This whole idea of pilgrimages, and it's just an ending thought. Like, it's been bonking around in my head for months. And like, I've been, I was so excited for this message. And then this last week, I felt like it was a struggle. And here's what I'll tell you. I think sometimes in our journey, there are times where we just see God showing up everywhere. And we see him speaking everywhere. And we can get all jacked up and like, I'm ready to go. But then all of a sudden, when you start taking that step, you start hearing silence. You start wondering, where is he now? Here's what I'll tell you. If you've heard him speak into your life, just keep doing what you heard him speak. If you ever wonder what that is, he's always going to say, love, give grace. Seek my truth and my word. But here's what I'll tell you. like, If you are struggling to hear how and where he's calling you, just ask, Holy Spirit, I want to be led. 
go to him in prayer. Step in community with other people who are headed that same direction. If you need prayer today, if you want any of those things, come on down. We have people who would love to pray with you. If not, go out and be in community and then go out and be pilgrims in this community. We love you. We thank you. God bless you.